Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And the ninth verse says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And Paul went on to say, For whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. I want to speak to you uh, tonight with this simple title, Guard the Deposit. Turn to your neighbor and say, Guard the Deposit. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Somebody just begin to talk to him. Lord, we praise you. We lift you up. We magnify you. We exalt you. You're worthy to be praised. Lord, there's none above you. There's none beside you. There's none below you. It's all about you. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became a living people. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Hide me behind the cross. Let it be as you speaking, Lord, for we need to hear from you. In the name of the Lord, the church said amen. Would you give the Lord another hand clap of praise? As you're being seated in the presence of the Lord. I tell you, why don't you give these musicians and singers a hand clap? My, my, my. Amen. They outdid themselves this weekend. So, so, uh, I just feel, how many just feels, uh, you know, just all year, to be, to be honest, it ain't been that many days, so, but I just feel like there's a shift. I don't know how you feel. But I just feel like there's something about to really bust loose. How many would like to see heaven just open for us? Amen. It couldn't happen to a better group of people, Brother Green. The Lord just opened the heavens for us. Amen. I love him. You love him? Uh, Paul is wanting to, you know, at first we might could consider and say, well, Paul was leaving this letter strictly to to Timothy, um, but because that we have, you know, studied enough and understand enough, we know that Paul understood that what he was preaching was much, much bigger than Timothy. And so we can't get uh, we can't get sidetracked and say, well, this was a letter only to Timothy, because um, Paul knew, and, and I believe some of us we would do well by understanding this. What the Lord says to one. He says to all, amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, for instance, what doctrine he may give you will be the same doctrine for me. What blessings, uh, spiritual blessings I'm speaking of that he gives you, then obviously it would be mine as well. Aren't you glad of that? And so he's writing to Timothy and he says, now I want to stir up your remembrance. I want to put thee in remembrance. Now, I don't know if, if Timothy needed to be reminded, uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing that being that he's a, a man like I am, he's a person like we are, that, that I'm guessing that he could get in a funk just like we could get in a funk. Is, is that all right to use that? And, and I'm guessing, Brother Kentrell, that, that it would be safe to say that Timothy must have needed reminding because that is what the apostle is doing. He's reminding him. Now, he's, now, notice this, everyone, and especially those watching. Uh, he does not remind him of his failures. He does not remind him of his mess-ups and his disappointments. How many knows I don't need a reminder of that? It's ever-present on my mind. Wouldn't you agree with that? You don't have to kick me. I kick myself. You don't have to chew on me. I chew on myself. You don't have to be abusive. I abuse myself. That isn't what I need a, 
a, a, a, a, a memory shock in, but, but rather he doesn't come to him and say, well, you know you was a bad boy last week or you did this or you did that, but rather he reminds him, he refreshes his memory on the gift of God that is in his life. How many needs a reminder of that? You know, it's easy to, to, get, to get in this life and to get drained. I mean spiritually drained. And you know, we'll actually forget a prophecy that was given over to us that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt was the voice of God. We knew it so clearly and we heard it so, so precisely and we knew it and it was vindicated in our hearts and life's got a way of just drowning that out to the point that we don't even think we can be saved. And sometimes we need someone just to come by with a friendly reminder and say, I remember the gift the very day that the gift of God was activated in your life. Now I want you to know something. This wasn't just some two by four preacher. This wasn't, not even Timothy, ladies and gentlemen, was just a fly-by-night evangelist. But rather, according to Apostle Paul, you could hear in the dialect and the persona of Paul that he was passing the literal torch to Timothy when he said, Son, be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He was absolutely letting you know, when I'm gone, you're the man, Timothy. Forget what was yesterday. Forget what happened two years ago and press forward for the mark that I have set before thee. I mean, lazy, if we put more time and effort and, 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 and sicken, can I say that? And sicken our young men and women on and sicken our elders. You can do it. You can preach. You can sing. You can apostify. You can do everything God's called you. There's power and there's a, there's a voice inside of you. Think about it. He said, I gotta, I'm gonna put you in remembrance. And I'm gonna stir you up. Do you remember that time, Timothy, where I laid hands on you? And that gift come alive? It wasn't that Paul gave him a gift. The gift was already there. But put on, when as soon as he laid hands on him, you know how what I'm talking about. Some of you has hands laid on you and you felt things you ain't never felt before in your life. Can I get an amen to that? I've seen people slain in the spirit. And I mean, they, they, wasn't, they wasn't catnapping. They was absolutely out. Amen. Amen. Like a worker on a government job after four o'clock. Slam out. Checked out. And there wasn't nothing to wake them. Nothing to bring them up. They was in a deep, deep sleep that only the hand of God could have brought upon them. You've seen that. We've witnessed that. Paul said, I laid hands on you, Timothy, and you felt something activate in your life that, that you didn't even know was there. There's two, different, there's two people sitting under the sound of my voice. One person has had the, the glory of God activated in your life, the call of God activated in your life, and you've allowed it to go dormant. You've allowed it to go stale and stagnant, and, and you're not used to it. You're not operating. You're not walked in it. And then there's those that don't even know they have a voice. Oh, think about it, saints of God. I want somebody just to lift your hands and say, God, activate in me what you've given me from the foundation of the world. For he goes a little further with Timothy. He says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I must establish a thought. And the thought is we have to, we have to guard the deposit. Now, that, that, that thought is something we should consider. What do you mean? Well, anybody ever deposited a check? Then you know what a deposit is. Amen. Amen. So when you make a, a deposit, then ladies and gentlemen, uh, you hopefully, if, if they don't hold it for two weeks, you, you, you hope that the next business day you can use what's been deposited. Amen. And so you make the deposit. Well, what Paul is, is, is saying to Timothy, he says that uh, I put thee in remembrance to that, that, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hand. He said, now this deposit that was made into you, Timothy, was made none other than by the hand of God. Amen. Now let me tell you something, uh, Saint. Let me, let me just clear something up. If the Lord made a deposit in your life, then let me tell you something. The Lord does not make bad investments. I, I've been trying my hand a little bit at cryptocurrencies. You know, not much, just a little here and there. And, 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 and I know that at the end of the day, I, I'm a novice. 
And I know at the end of the day, I could you lose that hundred bucks. But, but, but I've decided, I said, well, you know, if it does good, it does good. If it don't, it don't. I, I may be making a bad investment. I really don't know because, number one, I have no control of the end. Are you with me? I say it again. I have no control of the end, and I don't know what the end looks like. But the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows the start date and the end date. He knows the in-between date. And when he made that deposit in your life, he wasn't gambling. He wasn't trading in the stock market. But rather, he made an investment, and he will get a return on his investment. Amen. So, so in that case, he sends people by, such as Paul, to lay hands on you, to pray for you, and to say, you're coming up from this. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm coming up from this. And I'm coming down from here. Amen. How many loves him? I want to get down here with you in case I need to twist an ear. And he says, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear but of love, power, and sound mind. He says, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions. Oh, that's a word we don't hear much, isn't it? Be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You mean to tell me with the gospel, with the call of gift comes afflictions? That means he's with me today. That's what the writer's saying. He's saying, look, if you want the call of God, you've been given the call of God, but let me go ahead and warn you, there's going to be some afflictions attached with it. Because it, it isn't that God is mean. It isn't that God's a monster. But ladies and gentlemen, somebody else knows you have a call as well. Come on, somebody. Somebody else knows you have a call as well. There's an evil one that, that roams to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He knows you got a call in your life. Don't think he's just going to sit back and not let nothing happen. He's going to do everything in his power to saturate or rather kill that deposit. Life has a way of trying to just suck you of every bit of life you have, Brother Green. Amen. And so... This is, this is a device of Satan, if you will, but, but also this is a trying of our faith. How many wants to be tried and true? Well, think about it. But this is the important part. And so here he, he says, look, he says, just, just have confidence in the gift of God. Have confidence in this gift. How many has confidence in the gift of God? He says, he has saved us, called us with the holy calling. Notice this, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. You catch that? His purpose. So now, ladies and gentlemen, what this scripture is saying further supports what's already been said. There's a gift of God that's been put in your life, and it isn't for you. It isn't for you. It isn't for you to get rich from. It isn't for you to get popular for. It, it has nothing to do with you. But it was put in you for God's own purpose. The call in your life is not for you. You can boast, oh, I'm called to preach or I'm called to sing or I'm called to obey. Whoopie-doo, that don't mean nothing. You're just a vessel. You're just a vehicle. He did it for his own purpose purpose. He has a purpose. He has a purpose. Think about it. Guard the deposit. So this is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, we find ourselves so absolutely engulfed in life and, and, and downtrodden and feeling like we, we, sh we should just jump off a bridge, so to speak. And the reason, Brother Green, is, is because if this was simply our gift, then we could walk away from it. How many is with me? <laughs> if this was simply my gift, sister, uh, priest, I would walk away from it. I would, I'd be on the riverbank fishing if it was my gift. Are you with me? I would choose something else to do if this was my gift. 
If I had give myself this, I'd be like, okay, the fun's over. Let's move on to something else. But the problem with being called of God is God gave you this gift. And when he gave you this gift, it come with strings attached. Not strings for him to manipulate you. But ladies and gentlemen, you can quit this gift. And every night laying down on your back, there's something screaming in your ear. There's a fire in your belly. There's a loneliness that you can't explain. There's something burning and yearning because it ain't yours. It's been given by the creator. And when he put it in you, it's alive. It ain't just you now. It's you and him. It ain't just you. It's you and him. Think about it. You can't get away from that, Brother Cody. You remember Jeremiah saying, it's like a fire. Shut up inside my bones. Elijah, I'm going to go hide. I'm going to go get in a cave. Ain't nothing but crazy folks in caves, saints. Are you with me? I'm going to get in a cave and hide out. I ain't sticking around. No way. No, no. I'm going to hide out. He couldn't hide. He couldn't get away from the voice of God. Why? Because that wasn't Elijah's gift. Elijah wasn't born to a unique family. He wasn't born to a special genealogy and generation. It had nothing to do with, with what his makeup and how he was brought up. Some of the greatest evangelists that's ever been known to the world what was, was from people of no renown whatsoever because it, the, your DNA don't make you. The gift of God is what establishes you. You can't get away from this, Timothy. I'm just bringing it to your remembrance. It's not yours. It's his. I'm just bringing it to your remembrance, Sister Emma. It's not your gift. It's his gift. You ain't cool, Brother John. There's nothing special about you because you're anointed and you can preach and you have a great intellect. That, that means nothing. That's God's gift. That ain't your gift. I'm getting to something. And we got to see, this is God's own purpose. So now we've got we to number something. We say, so that means God has a purpose for me. Oh, hallelujah, anyhow. If, if he gave me a call, if he gave me a gift, he didn't do that for no reason. He says, I got a purpose for Brother Bill Green. Let me tell you something, brother, ladies and gentlemen. L.F. Bosworth, he said, a man is immortal until God is finished with him. I saw it on his tombstone. He said, man is immortal until God is finished. He was convinced of the same thing that I'm convinced of. If God put a gift in you, you don't leave until he says you can leave. Come on, somebody. See, there's some of us struggling. And, and when we know, we get in the presence of God and we know this is where I want to be. This is where I want to reside. This is where I want to stay. And then we get home and all of life comes on us and we feel like we're beating, getting our brains beat out. Anybody bear witness with that? Then we get back in the spirit of the Lord. This is where I want to be. This is where the only place I have peace. This is the only, and you know what that is? That's that purpose. That's that purpose. That's God. That's God saying, you got a job to do. You can't play with these boys. You got a job to do. You can't play in the world. You got a job to do. I gave you my purpose. Oh, think about it. Now, isn't this amazing? Because we're not now, we figured something out. We're not just people that got saved. Because I don't know if you know this or not. The Lord knew you before your mom and daddy did. And he gave you the purpose before your mom and daddy knew you. I mean, he's with you. Amen. That's, that's the only way it could be, saints. Right? The Lord didn't wait till you was born and count all your fingers and toes like we do as parents. You know? And say, okay, he, he looks pretty good. I, I'll try this one. I know it's a gamble because his daddy boy, he's crazy. But I'll try this one. Now, he, don't, he don't judge things like we judge things. For the Bible says we judge no man by the flesh, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. He says, Paul went a little further with it. He says we no longer even judge Jesus by the flesh. He, he took it a little further, didn't he? We don't even judge the Lord by the flesh. 
You know what he was saying? He said, if you see somebody with nail scars in their hand, don't think they're Jesus. I can put nail scars in my hands myself. I ain't Jesus. You follow me? That don't mean you're Jesus. How many is with me today, saints? He said, don't judge nothing by the flesh. He said, because there'll be people saying, Jesus is over here. He says, well, if you run over there and you, you really, oh, man, I see a nail scar now. I see a piercing his side. I mean, he, he, he really, and he, he's saying he's 2,000 years old. How do I know if I ain't seen him? You, you can be persuaded of something you ain't supposed to be persuaded of. You said, brother, that, that don't exist. Ladies and gentlemen, there's been people all over the world, even in the last 15 years, that claimed they were the Messiah and had millions of followers. Millions of dollars flooding in every week and month and year. Don't tell me people are not gullible. Listen, you can be gullible. But we, we, we don't look in the mirror and say, God can't use me because of my stature. God can't use me because of my failures. God can't use me because of my mishap. God can't. Let me tell you, if he put it in you, he's going to use you. All the rest is just fodder. All the rest is just, just for him to sit back and say, look how I confounded all the wise minds. I used somebody they didn't think could be used. I got glory out of somebody they didn't think I could get glory out of. I absolutely shook the world by a bastard child. Look at what I can. I'm God. I can do whatever I want to do. Amen. Think about it. Because it ain't us. It's him. It's his purpose, his call, his gift, his design. It's all about him. So it don't matter how, how, how. You know what? Let me tell you. I'm going to be transparent with you. I wanted to quit. I could see the benefits in quitting. I said, Lord, I'm burnt over ground. You ever heard that expression? Brother Green, you've heard that expression. Grandma's heard that expression. I was raised by an old timer. He'd say, McKinney, you burn over ground, son. <laughs> and so that, I look at myself and say, I'm burnt over ground. And you know what? I feel the pressure of that. The gravity of mistakes and failures and disappointments and maybe not even things that I cause, maybe somebody else caused. And, and just pressing down on me. And I'm like, man. I don't need to be doing this. I can be a, a good Christian and just go to church like everybody else. And you know what, I, what I'll do? I'll sort of back up a little. Just take a seat. See if somebody else will sort of walk in here and take things by the range, you know. And I'll sit back a minute and you'll be laying there at night trying to sleep. First thing he's going to do is rob you of your sleep. You're looking up, you're like, man, what are you doing up there, bro? I'm trying to sleep. You ain't sleep, sleep, slept for days, you know. Hurting. I mean, knows what I'm talking about. Like, well, what you doing up there, bro? I thought we had an agreement. You don't care about me. And they ever felt that way. But you know what? You're going you're gonna to feel something stirring inside you. And you're going to like, bless God. So you know what you're going to do? You're going you're gonna to find yourself off by yourself. You're going to sneak a peek at the book. As soon as you do, it's going to talk to you. You're going to like, what are you doing, man? All right, I'm going to preach one more time. How many is with me? And I'm like, all right. Honey. Oh, it's burning in you all week. You're like, my God, I'm about to preach to the boys on the job. But I can't do that. I'm too busy hollering at them. So I can't preach to the boys on the job. You know what I'm talking about? What are you trying to say, brother? See, if it was me. I would drown it. If it was just mine, Brother Kentrell, I'd do away with it. I know how. You know how. We know how. Right? If, if, if it was ours, we could just discard it. Ain't that right, sister? Priest? But, but you know what? Because it ain't ours, it's God's. You can't turn it off. I'm, I'm here to tell somebody tonight, what you're feeling will never go away. What you're wrestling with will never shut up. It's going, you know, I told my young people this morning in Sunday school, I said, well, you can come about this thing two ways. You can either come to God unscathed without any bruises, scratches, and broken bones, and heartaches, and disappointments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can come to him that way, or you can come to him busted up. 
Because if he made a deposit in your life, he's getting it out. Because it's not for your purpose. It's for his purpose. Let me ask you something, ladies. Do you believe that he could have chose wrong when he chose Jesus? Do you believe he could have chose wrong when he chose Peter and Paul and James and John? Ladies and gentlemen, it looked like in, for a split second in history that he chose wrong when he had Peter because Peter denied him to his face three times. It looked like, it looked like Jesus messed up on this one. Peter's going to betray him. Peter's going to go the other way. Peter, but ladies and gentlemen, you know what Peter had in him? Something that Peter didn't put there. And when Peter laid down at night, that rolled over in his head, I'm not a deceiver. I'm not a deceiver. I am the disciple that God said I am. So I'm going to guard this deposit. I'm going to guard it with my life. And one day bring him glory from this old deceiving Paul. Hey. Look like he messed up. Can you imagine? Look like he made the wrong decision with Saul before he was Paul. Look like he made the wrong decision with Joseph. Look like he made a lot of wrong decisions. And based solely upon the efforts of humanity, he did make a lot of decisions. But ladies and gentlemen, aren't you glad that our success rate is not established by how good humanity can be? Our success rate has nothing to do with how clean I can live. It's not by my works, but rather it's by his purpose. And if his purpose is established in me, then my works will eventually line up with his purpose. Oh, thank him. Who hath saved us, called us with a holy call. It's a holy calling that you're called by. It's a holy calling. Not according to my works. You know what he's saying? Jonathan, you didn't do nothing to deserve this calling. Any preacher that never, that, that's called of God didn't do anything good enough for that calling. Guess what? A preacher is just like you. Got thoughts just like you. I don't care who they are, Brother Thomas. They all the same. They all fashioned alike. That's the facts. They, 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 some was better at repressing that. Some was better at, 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 at fleeing youthful lust and things like that. But at the end of the day, they all had to wrestle with the exact same things you and I have to wrestle with today. Quit beating yourself up saying you're not worthy. Quit beating yourself up saying that you're not valuable. Quit beating yourself up. If it was only about you, I would say you're right. There ain't none of us worthy. But it is not with my works. But it's the finished product of Calvary. And I am guarding that eternal deposit. Think about it. All my hope is in Jesus. Do we believe that? Then why are we still trying to work for something? Are you with me? I said, brother, you getting away from where? You getting, you getting away from living right? That ain't, ain't what I'm talking about. You know what your works is going to do for you and it's already done for you? It's going to make you arrogant. It's going to make you haughty. We know people like this. I do. They clean as a pin on the outside. They are. And you know what? You, you meet them. I met one just the other day in Walmart. And I tried to talk with them. And they gave me that you a Pharisee look kind of thing, you know. And I was like, man, they must have been in a hurry. Had somebody with me. They says, no, not unless they always in a hurry. Because that's where they always act. You know that. Hmm, who's this peasant trying to talk with me? How many knows what I'm talking about? Oh, this is just a lowly peasant down here trying to talk with me. You know what? Paul said, he said, it's not by men's works. He says, lest they should boast. 
He said, look, if your works could make you any cleaner than the stripper down there that ain't got God yet, you're going to get haughty and look down at her and say, well, I never stripped before. Most of them want to. They just ain't never done it. Come on, somebody. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, it's the, the, the issue is it's the love of God that constrains us. For the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Not that I'm the holier than thou that leads people to repentance. Why I'm saying that, ladies and gentlemen, is these people does not have the revelation that it's not them. It's God. If they had the revelation that it was God, then they would still care about their appearance. They would still care about works and living right. But they would know it's only by his design that I'm saved. It's only by his mercy that I'm saved. It's only by his blood that I'm saved. It's only by the design of Jesus that I'm saved. Nothing else matters. Nothing else. Think about what he's saying. I wish I could put it on the board, but that's tore up. So, Who hath saved us and called us with the Holy Ghost, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Some of you thought I was lying a while ago, and I said, you know, you, your mom and daddy wasn't good enough to get you this gift. No, no, no. Before the world began, the Lord seemed for the John Green. Aren't you glad? The Lord seen Sister Emma. Now, you, some of you are going to say that's not possible. How in the world can your Creator not see you? That's strange. I hope He can. Amen. Before the world was, He saw Michael, Brother Michael Green. Right? He saw us all. Aren't you glad He saw us all? And so He saw us and He put a gift in us. For his purpose. And he said, look, guess what? This is what he said to Jonathan. He said, now, Jonathan, you're going to get arrogant because that's how you McKinney's are. You're going to get haughty because that's how you McKinney's are. Hey, man, you're going you're gonna to go through all that. He says, you know what? But I, but I got something to fix all that. I'll break you down like a double barrel. I'll drag you through every briar patch you can imagine. You'll be so skin up and broke up and messed up. And, and by the time you feel like you've done it, you've, you've done been through it all and you're not worth it to anybody, he says, then you'll be just about right for me. How many knows what I'm talking about? Because you know what? He wants you humble. He wants you broken. He wants you not to look at people uh, strange when they come into church wearing earrings and tatted all up, messed all up. He wants you to be able to preach grace to them, preach mercy to them, preach conviction to them, and love on them. And when they spit on you, love on them. And when they kick you, love on them. And when they abuse you, love on them. He wants you to be able to show his purpose. And his purpose is showing Christ. Oh. Think about it. You got, if you can't do that, you ain't been drugged through enough briar patches yet. My brother was telling me the other day he was evangelizing at a place. And this uh, and the person there come up to him because he brought some people with him, you know, that didn't quite look like them. And they said, hey, you need to preach on dress code tonight. They're just visiting. Preaching from observation. My brother said, I, I can't do that. Lord ain't told me to preach on that. I'm visiting anyways. Are you hearing me? Saints of God, who are we to judge another man's servant? Who are we to lay our mouth or our hands on someone that God has called his? First John said, he says, how great it is that we should be called the sons of God. Brother, when he said that, religion shifted. Because it went from religion to sonship. It's, it's important to understand something. That you're not a member of a church. You're a member of the family of God. And you know how you get about family? When your family start talking about family, you're like, hold on. I may not like my cousin right now, but you get your mouth off my cousin. I may not like my sister right now, but you get your mouth off my sister. 
I may not like my brother right now, but you get your mouth. We're just going to blows now. I don't feel real close to you right now. I mean, we're about to fight. You know, you may know what I'm talking about. You can talk about family, but there can't nobody else talk about family. When you left the church and entered the body and family of God, then guess what? He feels that way about you. And guess what? Other brothers and sisters feel that way about you. And when they see you down, they say, don't you be kicking my brother. Don't you be kicking my... What I'm trying to say, you have way more support than what you think you got. You have way more rooting for you than you got rooting against you. You just need to raise up. Raise yourself up. Get in the book. Start reading about your family heritage. And realize, I was put here for a purpose. I have a destiny that's only in God, and I'm going to guard my deposit. Come on, give him some praise, saints of God. Hallelujah. Think about it. In closing, I want to remind you of this. Can you imagine? Young people, let me tell you a story. Real quickly, this is someone that's born with a purpose and a call in his life. This young boy is named Joseph in the Bible, and he's having these crazy dreams. And these dreams actually, actually convince him that the moon and stars and the sun is going to bow down to him. Crazy dreams, right? Well, guess what? His brothers are jealous because his dad realizes there's something special about Joseph. So his brothers do something crazy. They sell him. This, this boy's in a hole waiting for the nearest gang to come by and pick him up. All out of jealousy. Because you know what? There was a call in his life. One of the first telltale signs that you're called of God is when you find people jealous at you for no reason whatsoever. They don't even know why they're jealous of you. They sell him into, into slavery and one thing leads to another. But everywhere he goes, even in slavery, he finds himself climbing the ladder. He's like the foreman or something. You know, he's like the boss man in the slave camp. Right? And, and, and things shift and change. And before long, he's second place to the boss man on a plantation. He's at a brother's house called Potiphar's house. Still sold by his family. Ain't heard from him in a couple years now. Mom and daddy believes he's dead. He's mourned the loss of a family. And then Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him. And, and you know, he knows he's a man of purpose. And he knows that he's a call in his life. And so he resists Potiphar's wife. And she claims that he tried to mess with her and has him thrown now in prison. Quickly, he's in prison for a couple years. But he still sees visions. Let me tell somebody something. You know it, and I know it, and I preached about it. It don't matter where you go. If you got a call in your life, it's always there. It don't shut off just because you went to the pokey. It don't stop just because you lost a loved one. It don't stop just because you messed up. It don't stop because it ain't yours. If it was yours, you'd drown it out. You'd shut it up. But you can't stop it, can you? It's constant. He's in prison. Accused of rape, having visions and revelations. Well, God sure knows how to use folks, don't he? Butcher and a baker comes to him. They said, look, we've had these dreams. Can you interpret them? He said, I sure can. You come to the right person. By this time, saints of God, he's done humbled himself. He's done got humble. He ain't telling everybody his dreams no more. Let me go on and tell you something. You can't share your dreams with everybody. He done quit telling everybody his dreams. That's thing got him in trouble. Right? And so, but guess what he does? He interprets the butcher and the baker's dreams. And it comes to pass exactly how he says. All because there's a call in his life. He's gone through all of this, y'all. 
nine years of hell on earth because there's a call in his life. Long story short, Pharaoh starts having visions. And the butcher says, I know a man. He's in prison, but I believe he could tell you what you're seeing. Pharaoh called him up. He got him a razor and a bath, shaved himself. Looked like when you approach the king, you got to look like something. And he cleaned himself up real good. He stood before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh told him everything. And Joseph said, This is exactly what you must do. And he interpreted it right down to the nitty gritty. And you know what Pharaoh done? He got his robe out, throwed it on him, brought him from prison. But the call never left. Why? Because the call wasn't for Joseph. The call was for God. It was for God's glory and God's honor. And now, ladies and gentlemen, one day out of prison, didn't have to go before a parole board. Didn't have to get some fancy lawyer to do certain. No, no, no. The stroke of the king's pen. He's riding around in the same chariot that Pharaoh has. People don't know the difference in Joseph and Pharaoh. Full circle. His family is standing in front of him. The very brothers that sold him into slavery. They don't know who he is. He disguised himself. He looks like an Egyptian. They don't know they're looking at their brother. And when it is revealed to them who he is... They fall to their knees and start begging for their life because he's a man of great power now. And he says, get up. I ain't mad with you. I ain't mad with you. He's got got their head on his shoulder because he's been weeping too. The Bible says that Pharaoh's house could hear him weeping. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. He would not have been weeping if he had only been three months removed from his family. It took years, Brother Green, to get him to a place where he could weep. I'm telling you, God has a purpose. If he has a purpose, he's getting it out of you. If he's got to send you to prison, if he's got to slave you slavery, whatever he has to do, you're going to weep. You're going to beg. And when you see the ones that abuse you, you're going you're gonna to say, you didn't do this to me. God has a purpose for me. And you know what he told his family? He said, don't weep. You didn't sell me into slavery. He said, but God did. That I might preserve a remnant. You know what Joseph come to? He come to the revelation that this ain't my gift. I was give this for his purpose. Think about it. I know I went a little long with you tonight, but I want you to get this. Sister Sherry, he said, if this was me, I would have died in slavery. I'd have took my own life. I'd have tried to run away. I'd have done anything. I would have messed with Potiphar's wife. But this ain't, this ain't Joseph. I was put here by God's call in my life to preserve a remnant. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have in your life is not just for you, but it's for a remnant. It's for God's people. Let's stand to our feet and let's start acknowledging Jesus Christ in this place tonight. And let's begin to thank Him for the gift that He's put in our life. If you need the altar, the altar is open. Let's begin to thank God for the gift that He put in our life. Let's begin to thank God. Let's thank Him for His mercy. Let's thank Him for His mercy and His compassion. Gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. The enemy's been defeated. His death couldn't hold you down.